morning. My name is Tom Whitney, and we're here to talk today about intimacy with God. Um, very important subject. It's our very first core value as a ministry, and we just want to talk about that, do that as a, a time of devotional study this morning. So intimacy with God, breathing life into our first core value. We always want to be talking about our vision and mission, and our vision is for all men in our movement to experience the power of one God, the value of one man, the leverage of one team, resulting in spiritual multiplication through businessmen throughout the world. Now as you look at that, what do you think is the key word in that vision statement? Any ideas? Power of one God? All men. All men. Other ideas? Reproduction. Reproduction. God. God. Very good. Very good. To me, however, the key word is experience. Because until we really experience those things, they're meaningless. Once we experience the power of one God, it empowers us to carry out that vision statement. But without the personal experience, it's pretty pointless, pretty meaningless. Well, our first core value, as we've talked a little bit about, is the preeminence of Christ. Intimacy with Christ is paramount and all that we do must emanate from our life in Christ and his life in ours. The key word here is intimacy. And that's a word that we really need to unpack because I think we talk about it a lot, especially in Christian circles, but do we really understand it? Do we really live it? So what is intimacy? Well, according to Webster, it's belonging to or characterizing one's deepest nature, marked by very close association and contact or familiarity. It's marked by a warm friendship developing through long association. I love that one. Suggesting informal warmth or privacy or of a very personal and private nature. And the root to the intimacy, intimate, is from the Latin intimus, which means innermost. So as we're talking today, I want you to think about those definitions of intimacy that whole idea of our innermost being and a warm friendship developing over a long association. So intimacy. It's talked about much in our churches and Christian circles, but in my experience in interacting with people, it's realized and experienced very little. The question is, why is that? We know that it's something that we're to pursue. We know that it's something that is powerful and life-changing, but we have a hard time achieving it. Why? So now here's another audience participation piece. And the question is, how were you or are you taught to pursue an intimate relationship with God? Prayer, worship. worship, give it time, slow down, give it time and slow down, scripture study, scripture study. Fellowship. fellowship with other believers, good. 
what is one of the things that's really emphasized in your daily relationship with God? Steve, I think you said it earlier. It's that scripture study, the quiet time. Time. Mm -hmm. time. It requires time. Well, one of the things that we struggle with, with intimacy, is that it tends to be a very intellectually driven exercise on our part. Scripture study, have your concordance, have um, a Bible study guide. Really think about, understand um, what's happening in Scripture. What we're really dealing with here is the influence of Greek philosophy on Christianity. And Greek philosophy put a heavy emphasis on reason and logic, and it had a disdain for anything to do with emotions or imagination. And that has bled over into Western Christianity, especially Protestantism, and has a profound impact on how we pursue a relationship with God. What this does is it focuses on and emphasizes the abstract and informational portion at, to the exclusion of the concrete and the experiential. It sets it up really as a, con a contrast. But the way our mind works is a lot different than that. And we're going to just talk a little bit about that this morning. So, in order to do that, how does the mind work? I have a question for you. How many right-hand turns do you make on the trip from home to church? I want you all to come up with that answer. Three, two, Three, two, two, one. two one, four. four. Steve, how did you come up with your answer? I traced the route that I take and uh, added up the number of times I come And how did you go about tracing it? You literally kind of got behind the wheel of the car mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and drove to church because you've done it enough times that you know what it looks like, right? Yep. That's how our mind operates. Let me give you some other examples. I want you right now to think of someone you love. Now my question for you is, how many of you saw the information that's contained on the driver's license for that individual? <laughs> Height, weight, hair color, color of eyes, home address, and driver's license number. Nobody raised their hand. I'm shocked. I'm literally shocked. So when you thought of that person, what did come into your mind? Smile, a face, a picture. That is how our minds work. That's how they store the information. And when you thought of that person, what did it evoke in you? Warmth. Warmth. And emotion. And emotion. Good. Another example. How many of you saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ? Okay. Now, how many of you gained new information from seeing the movie, The Passion of the Christ? So some of you gained a little, uh, uh, some new information. Was there a lot of new information or were you fairly familiar with the story 
of the crucifixion of Christ. Pretty familiar. Good. Now, I want to ask you, what kind of impact did watching that movie have on you? Huge. In what way? Experiential. Was experiential. What, what did it do? What kind of emotions did you experience and how did they differ from your emotions previously? The sorrow was more real. More real, the sorrow. Your love was more real. So what you have gained there is the concrete and experiential plus the informational piece so that now your whole brain is working together to help you understand that. My take on it is that God created our whole brain and we should actively use all of it as God designed it to work, especially in our relationship with him. So does the Bible say anything about the mind? Romans 12, 2 is just one of the real foundational verses. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Information alone can never lead to transformation. And that's the biggest struggle, I think, that we have had in Western Christianity in trying to help people to be transformed. Let's take a look at some other verses at what the Bible says. <clears throat> Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together. Informational, logic, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. What I love about that verse is that it talks about reasoning together. But then the example that the Lord uses are all pictures. Scarlet. White as snow. They shall be like wool. So God, in this verse, is giving us a great example of using those two verses together. Here's another good one, Psalm 145, 5. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. Now, we're in Denver, so I'm going to ask you, without using your imagination, to think of a mountain. How'd you do? We're surrounded by some glorious splendor. And if we're going to meditate on it, it's pretty hard to meditate on just the printed word mountain. What we need to do is to use our minds and think about the beauty that God has created. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Again, thinking about those words isn't going to do a whole lot for you. And finally, in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, 
are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. That idea of seeing Christ's face and allowing it to transform us, seeing it veiled, Paul tells us that now we see through a glass dimly, but then we shall see him face to face. But we're to be looking into the face of our Lord. Love this poem by Terry, Terry Churchill. I've been trying to reach you, climbing a tower of words, babbling words, dead ink. My heart cannot speak this language. So it smiles politely and nods its head and pretends to understand. But your words are not like this. You opened your mouth and creation said yes and appeared from nothing. Day and night, oceans and land, and me. All this with a few words. I want to hear you this way. I want to hear you in flesh and blood and blinding colors and music that carries me to you. Can you carve your meaning in my heart? Will you say to the motionless ink, rise and walk? To me, for so many years of my Christianity, as I did the disciplines of daily devotions, as I read through my Bible um, and studied the Word, so often it was motionless ink. Dead words on a page. And I think Terry really captured um, the feeling of so many Christians in this poem. Can you carve your meaning into my heart? Will you say to these motionless ink, rise up and walk? If we can figure out how to do that. It breathes life into that relationship with God. Well, you might think that, you know, Tom is up here, um, you know, the uh, mountain altitude is causing his brain not to work so well. Um, that's probably true, but People that know me say it never did work so well anyway, so let's look at a few quotes. Here's one from C.S. Lewis. He says, for me, reason is the natural organ of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. Think about that a little bit, that when we have that truth, and combine it with our imagination to bring life to it, we have meaning. I want to share with you, as an example of that, just a snippet of my personal testimony. Um, I was raised in a mainline denomination, um, went away to college and was dating a young lady who uh, I was interested in. She invited me to go to an evangelical church. Now, up until that time, I knew about God, but didn't know God and didn't have a personal relationship with him. So, being motivated, not entirely out of pure motives, um, I started attending the college and career class and Sunday morning worship at her church. I heard about something totally new. It was called a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Um, I got a lot of information on it, but didn't act on it right away. It was information. Now, on Good Friday evening, 1976, this college and career class was performing the drama for a passion play. Choir doing the music, college and career class doing the drama. The youth pastor had invited me um, discerning my spiritual condition to be a stagehand. So it's Good Friday night. Remember that, important. 
Um, passion play, remember that, fairly significant. And one of my responsibilities was after Christ had brought the cross to Golgotha to make the sound effects of nailing Christ to the cross. Guess what? At that point in time, the Holy Spirit helped me to experience Christ's love for me. So the information that I had now had the experience and with a hammer in one hand, a block of wood in the other, I prayed to accept Christ. I experienced his love for me. So I think Lewis had it right for me personally. Francis Schaeffer says the Christian is the really free man. He's free to have imagination. This too is our heritage. The Christian is the one whose imagination should fly beyond the stars. Wow. Have you ever heard that taught? Well, let's look at intimacy and another definition that I've come across. And that definition is into me see. Into me see. You know, in our human relationships, when we're striving for intimacy, one of the things that we have is vulnerability and transparency. That willingness to open up those parts of our lives to no one else and let them see into our innermost parts. I think there are some great scriptural examples of this. Um, God toward me, intimacy. I love this verse. Matthew 27, 50 and 51. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. And you might be asking yourself, what on earth does that verse have to do with intimacy? But the Lord just uh, showed me, gave me this picture. And I've got a question for you. What was the purpose of the veil or the curtain in the temple? Separation. Who was the only person that could go behind that curtain? How often could he do it? When that curtain was torn, personal relationship daily, moment by moment with God became the norm, the desired outcome. It was Christ ripping it open, exposing the heart of God and saying, into me, into me, see. That 
that's the God we serve. In Hebrews, we're told that the sun is the radiance of God's glory. The exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. If you want to know what God looks like, you have to see him through the eyes of Jesus. What about me toward God? Man, David nailed it. In Psalm 139, 23, 24, he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So the Bible teaches God's intimacy toward us and our intimacy toward God. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Well, Tom, you say, it sounds good. How do we get there? How can we experience intimacy with God? Well, some, some ways, you guys already hit on them when we were talking about it. We can engage our whole mind in worship time, in our prayer life, in our reading and study of the word. And what we want to do today is to experience that with you, to experience it together. Prayer. You know, so many times when I visit with different CBMC teams, um, you know, they pull out the prayer cards, we talk about prayer. Um, we tend to look at prayer as a list of objectives to be accomplished. And enlisting our Heavenly Father in accomplishing those objectives. But does that breed intimacy? Not typically. And how many of you, when going through that routine, have ever, ever had your minds wander? You know, you get to point seven on the 27-point list of things you're praying for, and you're going, uh, yeah, but I wonder if the coffee's done yet. <laughs> okay, so I'm weird. I'm the only one that has that issue. <laughs> what if we could turn our prayer life into something that created that intimacy with our Heavenly Father. One of my favorite ways to do that is picturing myself on God's lap. Because I'm His son, He's my Abba, Daddy. And it tells us that in Romans 18. Um, just a powerful powerful verse that tells us about Jesus being our daddy. You know, on Monday of this week, um, our 18-year-old, excuse me, 18-month-old granddaughter was at our house. It was just after lunchtime. She'd gotten down out of the high chair, wanted something else, and mommy told her no. Um, this created a Fairly significant meltdown. Um, not quite nuclear proportions, but you know how 18-month-olds can be. And uh, she was sitting, standing about four feet from me, and she looked up at me. <laughs> I just held out my hands. She came over, she was crying, picked her up, held her close. She laid her head on my shoulder and just let me hold her. After a couple of minutes, 
she settled down. Um, in fact, recharged, hopped down off of Papa's lap, and was off into the next trouble that she could get herself into. But that's a picture of what God wants to do for us. When we're sad, disappointed, happy, struggling, he's our Abba, our Daddy, our Papa. He wants to pick us up, to hold us, to allow, allow us to experience that warmth, that closeness, that safety, that security in him. So what I want to do right now is to just pause for a moment and ask you to experience crawling up onto Abba's lap allowing him to hold you and experience that with your Heavenly Father. So just close your eyes and go there. What does it feel like? Comforting. Many times as I do that, I can feel and hear his heartbeat of love for me. Another way to experience it is in the reading of your Bible. Um, not long after I first had started studying and learned about this, um, I was going through the Bible in a year, a discipline that I had maintained for a number of years. And it was in December because I was in the book of Revelation and uh, was in Revelation chapter 3. And... Um, Revelation 3.21 says, I will invite everyone who is victorious to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Man, what a verse. But as many times as I'd read the verse, in different translations and just read it? Oh, that's nice. Now let's try practicing that first, engaging our whole mind. So just close your eyes and I'm going to read it again and, and just kind of walk through it with you. It says, I will invite everyone who is victorious to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. So picture yourself going to meet Jesus. You're victorious. And hear him invite you to come because you're victorious and Jesus and the Father are ecstatic to have you join them so you know one of the things that that Jesus used when he was here on earth was parables and in the parables he used earthly things to help people picture spiritual things which they couldn't see. Well, I want to take just a couple of minutes um, to bring this a little more personal. And um, so what does this look like for Tom? And just talk about what's been happening for me in the last couple of weeks. 
For me, my life verse is Philippians 3, 10 and 11, and the Amplified Version has some very interesting words that I love. Um, it says, for my determined purpose is that I may know him. And then it says that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. It's a little harder to memorize than the NIV version. But it really unpacks it. Um, and so that's the frame of reference that I try to approach my walk with. Intimately acquainted is what the Amplified translated it as. And when we go back to the definitions that we started with, one of the definitions was suggesting informal warmth or privacy. So I have my quiet times in the family room and we know that where we are, Christ is with us. So I know that Jesus is there and I visualize him there with me. We talk informally as friends. There is warmth and there's humor. Um, for those of you that know me, I tend to have a kind of a sense of humor. Um, give you an example of that. Um, one of the things that I was um, kind of trapped in in my own mind is a, a formality with Christ. And I think that there's an appropriate type of formality, but if it's warm and intimate, um, you know, the formality is kind of a barrier or can be a barrier. So one morning, um, I just said to him, good morning, Lord. And I heard him say to me, good morning, subject. Now, it, very good natured, but the, the little discussion that we had was, you're my friend, you know, and it's okay to call me Lord, but know that you're my friend. And uh, man, I just, you know, when I heard that, I just chuckled and uh, enjoyed that reminder that I, I'm to be his friend. Then as I'm reading, and praying I invite his input. So recently, um, in the Lord into me see category, I was reading Luke 27 to 29. And I hadn't read it in the message, but one of my habits or practices is that if I read something that strikes me um, and I'm feeling challenged by, I'll go look it up in several different translations just to get the full picture. And I like the message. It says, to you who are ready for the truth, nope. I say this, love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, Gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. Okay, Mr. Peterson, I think you hit the nail on the head on that one. So I'm reading this passage and I sense a need for growth in some area of that, and I ask for his thoughts. Shared my life verse, Philippians 3, 10, and 11. A little farther on, in verse 15, Paul says, So let those of us who are spiritually mature and full-grown have this mind, 
and hold these convictions, and if in any respect you have different attitude of mind, God will make that clear to you. So Lord, into me see, there's something I'm sensing that needs to be different. Make that clear to you. Now I'm going to give a plug for the handbook to leadership that you guys are going to get a little bit later. Um, and Paul talked about yesterday. Um, and I've been using this this year. And I came across uh, this paragraph. It says, Our Heavenly Father has created us to reflect His perfection. And He will be satisfied with nothing less. The marvel is that God loves and accepts us as we are and that he is pleased with our faltering movements in his direction. I love that, our faltering movements in his direction. Because what I find is that when the Lord is bringing something to mind, it's not a heavy chastisement. There's always an attitude of, Tom, I love what you've done so far. And here's the next step. So he loves my faltering steps, but he said, there are two areas where I'd like you to grow. And they are, always value relationships over possessions. Love the person even when you feel you are being used. And there have been a couple of examples um, in my life recently that when he said these things, I knew exactly what he was talking about. Um, and my response was, Lord, I try. Show me how to do this well. And his reply was, rest. All right, Lord. I need, to, I need to understand that a little bit better. And uh, he is faithful. And he helped me. Took me to Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. That was the first verse that came to mind. And in the message it says, Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And I just love that part that I've highlighted here. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythm of grace. And I thought, wow. Okay, Lord, I'm beginning to understand. What else? Well, the 23rd Psalm. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. And then you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Going, all right, I'm starting to understand. Rest in you. Watch how you do it. Unforced rhythms of grace. And then one of my favorite Scripture verses for a long time has been Psalm 46.10. And Psalm 46 is describing wars and earthquakes and um, storms. And 46.10 says, be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The New American Standard tra translates it, 
cease striving man guilty as charged you know if, if there was a striving court um, I'd probably be there um, at least 360 of the 365 days a year and the message says step out of the traffic take a long loving look at me your high God above politics above everything so as I'm processing this um, and I'm still in the process of processing it um, what God is saying is look at me watch how I do it relax let me live out through you even when you're not feeling like you're on top of your game it's not your game it's my game so for me personally um, this idea of using my whole mind in my relationship with God um, has made a huge difference in my personal spiritual growth um, you know Paul tells us um, that the things that I want to do I don't do the things that I don't want to do I do oh wretched man am I and Paul fairly succinctly summed up how I have struggled with a lot of things in my Christian life um, as I learn better how to use my whole mind in my relationship with God to look at Jesus take a long look at him um, I am finding better luck better success in achieving victory in areas of struggle and encouragement in all areas of my walk with Christ. That's the end.